Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is politics and spirituality. With me is Ram Das, a noted spiritual teacher and author of many books, including Be Here Now, Christopher the Mill, Miracle of Love, A Gradual Awakening, The Psychedelic Experience, and most recently, How Can I Help? During the past decade, Ram Das has been active in social causes, including the Prison Ashram Project, Curing Blindness in Nepal and India, working with refugees in Guatemala, and working with American Indians on health issues. Welcome, Ram Das. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if we were to go right to the core of the issue, it, it strikes me that at the very bottom line, at the, at the root of things, the spiritual premise is that we are all one, and therefore, politically, we would want to treat the whole world as if it were our own body, in a mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. That would seem to me to be the, the basic premise of, of spirituality and politics. Well, uh, yeah, but there are many levels to understand that. You can understand it with your intellect, and you can understand it because you are that. And that's a very different place to act politically. Yeah. It's like uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, when you make yourself into zero, your power becomes invincible. Now, any politician or anybody in, in the life of trying to institute social change in a society would like to have their power be invincible. But it only happens when you aren't, but it is. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that is really hard, that you have to, in a way, die into not my but thy will for that kind of uh, potential impact on social change. I think there's a paradox there in a sense because if, if we totally sort of bow to the will of God, uh, it might lead us to, to not want to resist it's the current situation. It's an incredibly situation. interesting risk. Mm -hmm. And you've got to trust that when you have surrendered, you will hear so clearly the Tao says the truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And your longing to have it different than it is is ultimately a trap because it keeps you from hearing the whole gestalt, the whole way things are. And as you hear the totality of it, you trust that out of that will come an appropriate action, a dharmic action. Mm -hmm. And that's the trust of dharma. That's the trust in the wisdom of the universe that is greater than your own personal ego wisdom. Mm -hmm. So there is certainly as an exquisite risk in it. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you're... We're so used to working out of, I ought to do it, I should do it, getting behind ourselves and pushing. But the whole idea of trusting that if we didn't push, something would still happen is very interesting to explore in people. Well, there must be a fine line between trusting and not pushing on the one hand, and on the other hand, being really passionate about social change. But again, it's where passion comes from. Uh -huh. uh, if passion comes out of what I call milking the drama or comes out of um, identifying with the emotions, I think it's um, short of what the possibility is. There is, for example, what's called dharmic anger, where a, a, a Zen monk will beat his student out of the incredible amount of love and compassion he has. I would say that if you if you're deeply enough in love with the universe, then the passion that arises out of it is different than if you aren't. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I think the passion is a passion that comes out of a joyful r involvement in the universe. But I think it's the passion of a river or a tree. I don't think it has to be, uh, you know, very, ah, that kind of, although it could be. Well, you seem to be suggesting that the quality of, of one's actions in, in a political or social arena, or any arena for that matter, is really determined by internal factors. And that would make it, uh, would seem to me, impossible to, to judge the actions of anyone else, even a Stalin or a Hitler. I think it's pretty tricky business. I think you can make judgments about actions, mm -hmm. but you don't judge beings, you judge their actions. And actions are good or evil in the sense that actions increase paranoia and separateness or they increase unity. So you can judge actions and you can be opposed. I can say, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't agree with that action you're going to do. And in fact, I'm going to stop you from doing the action. But as Kabir said, do what you do with another human being, but never put them out of your heart. Mm -hmm. That if I have to harden my heart in order to oppose you, I lost. We both lost. Yeah. And that's part of the art of the inner and the outer. Of dialogue. You know, um, 
George Orwell in, in 1984 refers to Bra Big Brother as this sort of, one gets the sense that, that, that the game is that he's this loving tyrant, or at least his people believe that, that all mm. of the, the cruelties are done out of some kind of a benevolence. Uh, it, and it seems to me that, that there's a longing that, that people have for perhaps a benevolent tyrant who will come in and straighten things out for us. Uh, Dostoevsky spoke about how people yeah. long to, to take their freedom and, and lay it at the feet of, of a benevolent church that might act in a tyrannical way. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, I think the deeper issue is whether the universe is benevolent or not. Uh, because we all see that when you invest in an institution or another person, you are investing external to your own deepest inner truth. And you've constantly got to be running that back against your inner truth. You can't just join a club and then say, I surrender to the club. Like the whole misconception of a guru is that you surrender to a person. Y you only surrender to that which is the truth where God, guru, and self are one and the same thing. So when you surrender that way, you're surrendering that way at the same time. I could never imagine surrendering to something that would be, that would invalidate my intuitive wisdom. Mm -hmm. And as long as you keep connecting to that, but the question of whether or not, then you know, that you don't have to judge whether it's benevolent or malevolent, you just judge, is this harmonious with my inner being? Mm -hmm. I don't have to judge you, I just have to keep my own game on a straight path. Right. The question of whether the universe is benevolent or not, uh, that's an interesting one. I, because I have a sense, I was talking uh, with Jerry Brown, who mm -hmm. used to be a governor here and in California, and um, we were talking about that issue uh, of whether you have to assume a benevolent universe in order to trust deeply enough to surrender. Yeah. And we both could hear the lawfulness of the universe, and I would say that there is an evolutionary thrust that's not a Darwinian kind, it's much more of a consciousness evolution, or I mean the kind of metaphor I play with is the one manifests as the many returning to the one or something mm -hmm. like that. So there's directionality and in that sense it has values connected with it, but I don't think you'd call that either benevolent or malevolent anymore. You wouldn't call a clock benevolent or malevolent because it's going forward instead of backwards. Mm -hmm. Well, I know it's, it's a deep philosophical issue. There's a strong trend amongst existentialists and amongst behaviorists and, and atheists and, and left-wing uh, political people to suggest that the universe is fundamentally indifferent and it's up to us to create our own reality. And I guess often people feel that it should be created from the intellect, from rationality. Well, that's, I think, giving us really short shrift mm -hmm. because to me the intellect is a kind of a is a, a very small system within a much larger context and to deny the context in which the intellect functions is to leave one little segment of, of nature uh, trying to subsume everything under it. It's a lot like the drunk looking for the watch under the street lamp you know, when he lost it up in the alley but there's a light here and it's the sort of... It, it, what it also does is it makes the whole world object. The intellect makes the world object because it's all you always think about things. Mm -hmm. And that always puts you one thought away from where it is. So you're always an alien in your own universe when, you're, when you mediate everything through your intellect. Mm -hmm. So the fun is to have your intellect, as Ramakrishna said, it's a wonderful servant, but it's a lousy master. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably true. You spoke a little earlier about making political decisions and, and judgments in terms of how it fits, I think, with one's heart. Yeah. And I, it seems to me that in... Not heart, emotional heart. Uh -huh. You know, heart like Chinese sin sin or the atma, meaning the deepest tr place of truth. The core. The deepest intuitive place in one's mm -hmm. being, yeah. yeah. That, that, me, well, that would seem, that notion would seem to contradict what we see very much in the world about us now, which are religious uh, political movements, you know, the moral majority or the Islamic fundamentalism, yeah. where in the name of a particular religious dogma, certain political planks are, are established, and everyone within that organization or within that tradition yeah. is expected to support uh, a particular political attitude. Yeah. When... Um 
When there is a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty. When there's a lot of uncertainty, there is usually a lot of fear attendant to it. And how people react to fear is interesting. Some people just consume more. They say, I'll get it while I can because it's all going to blow up anyway. They become more and more materialistic. Mm -hmm. Some people want it, they want to be on the right side when the doors close, so they become fundamentalists in one sense or another. They grab on to right as opposed to evil. They want to be one of the 144,000 that gets in the door. Mm -hmm. And the other group uses it, the uncertainty, as a way to deal with their inner relationship to uncertainty, mm -hmm. and they go inward. And uh, you can see the society dealing with the fear that way. Mm -hmm. And so that that real thrust to the kind of righteousness uh, is staying at the plane of good and evil. It's staying at the plane of polarities. Mm -hmm. And it's not seeing, as uh, G. Manley Hall said, that uh, he who knows not that the prince of darkness is but the other face of the king of light knows not me. That's the one. If you, it's interesting that all these religions in our Western mm -hmm. sense, I mean Christianity and Judaism and Islam, are really monotheistic. They believe in the one, like Shema Yisroel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And yet, they always live within the two. It's like, it's all one, it's, it's one except for me, or except for us. And so we end up mea culpa ourselves. Because it's chutzpah in exoteric Western religions to think that you are one with the one. We say it's all one, but we don't really act as if it were all one, which, mm -hmm. which is much more like holography. <laughs> no, we typically act as, as if uh, we're very distinctly separate. Distinctly, distinctly. And we got mm -hmm. the bad end, we got the, you know, <laughs> the bad end of the stick, too. Yeah, original sin. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Because we fell out of something. And if you see it as the one exploring itself through us, I mean, through these multiplicity of forms that are all part of the one, and that it goes into the dream or the illusion or the... It gets entrapped in the separateness in order to awaken out of the separateness in order to see itself. And it's just a beautiful dance of this delicate form of the one at play. Mm -hmm. The whole thing lightens up a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I sense you saying is that you're making a clear distinction between spirituality and religion here between institutions that, that oh, see, religions do provide exquisite practices to get deeper into the spirit. The problem is that every practice is entrapping. You, I don't care whether it's meditation or Catholicism or the Torah or drugs or whatever, yoga or whatever it is, they're all traps. And the game of me method is that you've got to use the trap and risk being entrapped with the expectation that it will self-destruct if it really works. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if it really self-destructs, the whole priest class is out of business in institutional religion. Yeah. So that the game has a funny kind of top, a false top on it, because it's a, any institution that starts to have a you know, salaries and institutional structures and all that immediately can't self-destruct. It doesn't, it's not designed that way. Well, you suggest in your most recent book, How Can I Help, that through service uh, one finds a path to, to realization, to God or to enlightenment. And I sense that in all religions there is this path of service and that seems to come as close as religion really gets to political action. <clears throat> yeah, but the, the difference is where you do the service from. There are an awful lot of religion, religious organizations that do service, but they do service like um, will help the poor. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly karma yoga or the use of serving somebody to transcend the dualism between the server and the served. I mean, I'm talking about it as a very precise method of enlightenment, of serving where there is no server. Mm -hmm. Because the Bhagavad Gita says, be not identified with being the actor and be not attached to the fruits of the action. But still, you do it. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you help somebody where you're not attached to how it comes out and you're not busy being the helper? That's the art form. Then you're just doing what you're doing because you're doing what you're doing. You are the help. You're not the helper. You're the help. 
And who's getting helped remains open to question. If you're not getting helped by being a helper, forget it. You must be standing in the wrong place. It seems that the Bhagavad Gita really puts the issue in its starkest form. When, Doesn't it ever? When you consider that what, what's being discussed here is warfare, and in fact, warfare against one's own family. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one of which level to take that at, mm -hmm. because you also can take that metaphorically of the warring between the ego and the higher self and the whole internal battle. I mean, the, the fun of the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, is it's the, you can play with it at so many levels, like any good holy book. Mm -hmm. I mean, any good holy book is a multi-leveled uh, smorgasbord of possibilities of interpretation. Yeah. I have uh, seen um, some very right-wing mercenary-type people wearing T-shirts uh, with a slogan to the effect of, you know, kill them all now and let God sort out the, the ones later. Wow. <laughs> God, it's an extraordinary teacher. Yeah. You haven't heard that slogan. No, I haven't heard no. that one. I mean, it seems that some people uh, take, and it's almost a, a religious or a spiritual yeah. attitude, that they're going to do what they think they have to do when, yeah. when if they kill people, God will figure yeah. out who yeah. goes to heaven and who goes to hell, and they're not to blame. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Well, um, uh, the fact that they... Uh, God, I don't even know how to get hold of that one. The We're, fact that they're, that they're, I mean, the karma of an individual who will kill somebody because that individual feels they have the right way or the only way, uh, already their mind has made another person them. So what they're saying is they're going to kill all of them. Well, there are two ways to kill the thems. One is you go, <laughs> you know, with a machine gun. And the other is you extricate yourself from a world of us and them in your own mind. Mm -hmm. And then you've killed all the thems, and there's only us left. Yeah. The guy's in, in Guatemala, and one of the women, these women, widows, whose husbands have been murdered before their eyes, uh, one of these women said to, to me uh, through a translator, thank you so much for leaving your home and family to come to help us. And I... I just opened to it and I said, I didn't. You're my home and family. I mean, who's leaving what? And I felt that, the truth of that at the moment. Because she was defining it in terms of that she was them. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see her as them. She was us. Yeah. And that's part of the excitement of being willing to risk in service, seeing the beloved in all the forms and seeing yourself in all the forms. Instead of averting your eyes from pain and suffering, turn around and embrace it into yourself without being afraid you're going to be drowned by it mm -hmm. because you know you can say no without closing your heart. These are all a part of a piece that mm -hmm. beautiful service as a yoga is. Yeah. Well, you seem to be, if one carries your position to its logical extreme, it means being willing to look at the, at the grossest, most hellish misery on the planet. All of it. And embrace it. All of it. All of it. You look just directly at you learn how to keep your heart open in hell. Mm -hmm. You see the horrible beauty of the universe. I remember once I was um, teaching down at, uh, at Big Sur at Esalen, and they gave me a house to house sit, and it came with a cat. And the cat and I became buddies, and every day the cat would come in when I was meditating in the morning and bring in its morning breakfast, which was a lizard or something, which was usually <laughs> still alive, and it would sit down between my legs to eat. Uh, to be with me. And I would be sitting there being with God and I'd hear squeak, squeak, crunch, crunch, and I didn't know who to hate. I mean, I loved the cat, but suddenly the cat was a killer. And I loved the lizard because I identified with the, you know, and I went through all the changes and I mm -hmm. saw it is the phenomena of nature. You've got to be able to look at it all and say, yes, I acknowledge it. I acknowledge it without being so busy reacting to it that you don't, because you don't even understand why it is that way. I mean, my ability to see around the edge of the, as Rilke said, the billboard at the edge of town, being able to see just around the edge of the veil, and I can just see a teeny little bit, just like we all can, leads me to understand the game is much farther out than I thought it was. That suffering has, I mean, I can understand the term suffering is grace. I can't live it. Mm -hmm. I can live it at moments with little sufferings. But I can understand that there is a beautiful unfolding of awareness through suffering. That's what my work with the dying is about. Yeah. yeah. I remember once when I was a teenager, I heard a rabbi talk about what, what he felt was the essence of Jewish ethics. And he said that if 
I saw another man, and he had no clothes, and all I had was a pair of pants. I would take my pair of pants off and, and give it to him. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it struck me that, well, that's very beautiful. It really is, but I don't live my life that way, and I don't know anyone else who does. Uh, and yet, I think I hear that coming from you, that if, when we recognize the one as, as being ourselves, how, how can we not want to share our last pair of pants? I hear the question. Um, see, it's a very delicate one. Simone Weil, a philosopher, she was a wealthy Belgian, I think, and then she was so, she wouldn't take any more than the poorest person in the world had. And the result was she starved to death in her mm -hmm. 20s, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something interesting in that story, and there's always also something that is poignant about it, that you and I have a unique predicament, karmic predicament, that we were born in this time, in this place, with these potentials, these opportunities. I'm not sure all people have the same game in life. I'm not sure that I have to be just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that there may be a way in which I don't know, I've got to listen carefully to hear, I'm not rationalizing having more than another human being. Mm -hmm. But I know that if I have to spend all, like my guru said to me, God comes to the hungry in the form of food. Now, if I am t worrying about my survival every day, there's no way I can be, on, uh, be here with you. Right. And if I can't be with here with you, then all of us can't be sharing. Right. Nor could I be here with you. Exactly, right? yeah. so that in a way, we are part of the microcosm of human consciousness. We have a part to play, which means we have to have the pants in order to play. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I would give away my pants at that level. I would, you know, I'd explore it. I'd, I'd stay with the moment and see. I either would or I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the way I deal with it. I, guess. Yeah. I don't try to, I'm trying not to con out of it, but to deal with that. Well, it, it's an issue. Um, <clears throat> maybe another way to look at it might be. And I don't think I'm a bad Jew for not giving away my last <laughs> pair of pants, by the way. Well, that's an extreme example, but how about for example, building elaborate uh, houses of worship, cathedrals, synagogues, and, and churches. Well, you can look at those both ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but at the same moment, I can see that for people in very poor countries that have very little uh, mythic identity to give them joy, mm -hmm. when they go into their cathedral and they look up and they worship and light incense and there's the beautiful Christ, I can see that they get their lives enriched in a way that a lot of the regular daily stuff of their life doesn't do. And you could say the church is milking it so they're not getting an extra meal, but maybe it's feeding them in another way, which is its justification. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a black and white issue on that one. It seems to me what you're expressing here is, is a willingness to accept reality as it is. That's a big one, isn't it? Uh -huh. To accept our humanity. Yeah. And to accept that an institution could be serving and it could be a corruption of what it was intended to do. Mm -hmm. And it's probably a little of both, and so are we. Mm -hmm. And we've got to deal with that. We've got to accept our own humanity first. Mm -hmm. And then, and really accept it, not judge it so much. I really shifted from being and a, a judger of everything to being an appreciator of it, to just appreciating how it is. Mm -hmm. And it brings me into a much more intimate relationship. The judging mode is always distancing myself from everything. Yeah. So I'm not even judging judging now. Well, it would <laughs> seem to me that you must be much more skillful as a social activist or I as a political actor in any sense. If, if you're not judging people, it should mean to me that you can communicate with anybody well, in ideally, yes, mm -hmm. and I, that's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm working on, and what I'm doing is I'm going closer and closer to the fire all the time. Because, see, it's very easy for me to stay in my own little bailiwick around all of the people that are my yay-sayers, my constituency, sure. and everything I say, they say, oh, Ram Dass, oh, that's great wisdom. It's quite different to mix it up with some social activists who say, Ron who, you know, I mean, <laughs> they don't know me from anything, and you've got to be there with the truth of your being in that situation. Mm -hmm. And that to me is beginning to be exciting. For years I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't risk it. I said I can't, I, I think uh, Vivekananda once said, debates are for school children. 
And I thought, I will just represent what I represent. I'll do what I do. And the people that want to play will play. And the others will do what they do. And that's OK. I'm not judging them. We have different business. Mm -hmm. But now I see that we can maybe talk together. And mm -hmm. that's going to be interesting. That's, that's really the 60s anti-Vietnam and the 60s spiritual turning inward yeah. starting to find their way back together again, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, it seems as we're moving into the 90s that we're yeah. at a point where all of the old definitions of who we thought we were are falling away, and, and we find ourselves dialoguing with people we didn't imagine we yeah. would. Well, I mean, how much more could that be than with the invention of the telephone, or the invention of the radio, or the mm -hmm. invention of television, or air travel? Or <clears throat> mm -hmm. I mean, I take care of my father, and he's 90, and he was born in 1898. And I think when I'm thinking about this is a time of great change, I think of what changes have occurred in that man's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, he and I got, went on rides and saw the horse and the tracks that the horse and buggy that he went on made when he was a child that he lived in that world. Mm -hmm. And I realized the immense changes in our culture. Sometimes consciousness has gone along with it, and sometimes consciousness has just gotten more deeply entrapped in externalities. And that's that's what interests me, not the evolution of technology, but the evolution of the way the technology allows the liberation of consciousness. Yeah. Well, people have always commented, uh, so long as I can remember, that our inner growth hasn't kept up with technology, but, but perhaps uh, I'm not we're sure seeing, about that. Perhaps I'm we're not seeing sure the evolution of inner growth. I mean, when you think of the, us living with the bomb, yeah. I mean, I grew up at a time we didn't have a bomb. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to cut you short now, though. Our, our time is out, Ram Dass. The bomb just came. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with me. Jeffrey, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me, too. And thank you very much for being with us. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, back with Ram Dass, and we're discussing politics and spirituality. Welcome again. Thank you, Jeffrey. We were talking about the threat of nuclear war and the fact that perhaps the modern political conditions are creating a situation which is challenging the human spirit, uh, perhaps to rise to a, a, a newer level of, of wisdom or nobility. I mean, it's not quite a socially um, hip thing to say, but it might be the optimum conditions for for growth of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because having, as Don Juan says, living with death on your left shoulder or over your left shoulder, which is what's happening with the presence of the bomb, and living with the, with the threat of the fact that our greed may un ultimately destroy us uh, by polarizing us so much, all those things, those are forcing a degree of awareness that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And I would think that since the, the Holocaust of World War II, we've also been confronted with the dark side of human nature in a, in a way that is difficult to deny. Yeah, yeah. See, that one, you, you got to be careful where you go near it, because to say that the Holocaust, I mean, the human heart screams at the thought of the Holocaust. From another level, the Holocaust has forced us very clearly to confront and to awaken around the qualities of our humanity. Mm -hmm. Like when Buddha said, we are born with the five hindrances, with lust and greed, that's one, that's not even two, hatred and ill will, agitation, sloth and torpor, and doubt. And that's what we start with. And then you're not surprised when you see all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's because we were busy denying this part of our humanity that we keep getting trapped in it. And, uh, one of the darkest periods, I think, in, in human history would be the, the Inquisition during the uh, Middle Ages. And that was a time when people were pointing at, at the devil outside of themselves. And in the name of Christ uh, and in the name of eradicating diabolic behavior, yeah. I think some 10 million people were, were tortured and murdered. Yeah, the, um, the externalization of the dark side, as you call it, as of that is a familiar technique for not accepting personal responsibility for your own humanity. In each of us is, uh, as Freud pointed out, are all the instinctual urges to, uh, that, uh, that underlie killing and underlie rape and pillage and all those things. 
we also have other qualities. And if you go deeper than that, you get behind all that mm -hmm. even. Uh, although Freud didn't accept that possibility. But. I'm not convinced myself that, that we're really any wiser as, as a race, as, as a planet, than, than we may have been in the past. I think we're confronted with sort of a do or die choice that, that we have to develop our wisdom or we may not survive. But mm. it, it, I just don't know whether or not we're rising to that challenge. I can't really uh, figure out which context to use to determine the answer to that. I mean, uh, because I'm trained in Hinduism, I've got these vast time games like yugas and kalpas, mm -hmm. which involve uh, 400,000 year units, you know, and this is known as the Kali Yuga within, and there's the Sat Yuga and, and all these yeah. different things. And this is a time when you would expect things to be this way. Great darkness. Uh, great <laughs> darkness, and yet those are the, ki the conditions which are optimum for the next thing, which is the Sat Yuga. And they all keep going in this rhythmic cycle. And if you stand back far enough, if you stand back far enough, nothing's happening at all. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting place. And that's equally as real as the question is, do you think it's really changing? Or do you think it's just all end? molecules spinning around, and it always has been. And even that's all mm -hmm. in time and space. Mm -hmm. If you go behind time and space, uh, Hakuin, the Zen monk, says you're coming and going as nowhere but where you are. Mm -hmm. There's nothing happening. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. I mean, it's just the illusion of movement and the illusion of evolution and the illusion of reincarnation, and it's all dream stuff. Well, you know, I, I like that notion. I, we come back to it from time to time in the interviews, and it dawns on me that there's something very, very profound in, in that idea. It suggests to me that everything that I perceive is ultimately in, in my own sensorium, and perhaps, as Bishop Barclay put it, in the mind of God. It, it gets one back to solipsism, which has always struck me not as a trivial philosophy, mm -hmm. but as a very profound and rich philosophy. I, uh I'm a, uh, a student of Theravadan Buddhism, and uh, like a couple of years ago, I spent about two and a half months in a monastery in Burma, in Rangoon, sitting in a cell, watching the muscle in my abdomen rise and fall with each breath. And every time it went up, I noted rising, and every time it went down, I noted falling. And I did that from three in the morning till 11 at night, every day for two months. It was about two months, I guess. When I got tired of that, I could stand up and walk around the cell watching my feet lift, push, place. Lift, push, place. And you're, what you're doing is you're bringing your awareness to one point, and then that allows you to see the way in which the thoughts keep arising, and your awareness keeps being grabbed by the thought. And so you, be, you keep identifying as the thinker instead of the awareness that lies behind thought. And as you keep practicing this absurd game on and on and on and on, your mind gets so quiet, you begin to see the way in which your mind is creating your universe. And that is an awesome moment. It really is. Because up until then, it's been a kind of a theoretical game that we aren't who we think we are. And suddenly, you have just touched that place behind it. It's not a place. You've, you've entered behind thought, because yeah. even the concept of place is a thought. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, that's the great liberator. Because from then on, you begin to see the way in which you see me as Ramdas or I see you as Jeffrey, is all a creation of mind. I don't know what's out there. I just know what my mind is creating of what's out there. Right. And it's fun because you begin to be, appreciate that you're living in your creation. Then you say, well, why did I create you? You are my karma and I'm yours in that game. And uh, why did I create you? And then one is th thrown into the world of karma, of how is the whole sequence of cause and effect. How are all my relations with um, people in blue jackets affecting <laughs> how, what I see at this moment when I look at you? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it gets quite exquisite to keep getting behind your own thought to see the way you're doing it. It's like being a voyeur of your own mind and you, you are beginning to learn how to rest in the place behind thought so that your mind is basically empty all the time. You're not thinking at all. And then thoughts rise up as they're appropriate instead of always thinking all the time, which is what most people are doing. Yeah. Most people are thinking all the time.
And when you get behind there, you begin to see other people's minds very clearly. They come at you like these huge mind nets that are coming up saying, this is reality, this is reality, this is reality, this is reality, and this is who I am, this is who you are, this is reality, this is who I am. And they keep their mind nets are these thick things, and you're walking in and around all these mind nets of other people's minds. And you begin to feel their projective systems coming at you. And you make yourself like a sieve, and they pass through just like water, and instead of being reactive to it. How do you go from that space to all of the social activism which, in which you've participated? Well, the social activism I've participated in is, is primarily the initial focus was that it was the leading edge of the way I could work on myself. See, what I'm aware of is that if I'm going to relieve another human being's suffering, I've got to extricate myself from my own. Because if I'm identified with that in me which suffers, when I try to help somebody else out, there's a funny way in which I'm digging the hole deeper for both of us. It's <laughs> a very subtle point. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas Merton said, if you're going to help somebody that's, that's drowning in a river, you've got to have a place to stand to get them. Otherwise, there's no sense in just jumping in and drowning with them. And so when I started working with dying people, for example, I could see that the basic, the first chakra or the basic preoccupation of us as incarnates was survival. Mm -hmm. And that the closest I could come to that issue of survival the closest I could confront that basic clinging or holding or fear so that being with dying people was the leading edge I could work with because if I could get to the point where I could be with death without flickering not through closing my heart staying right here wide open and still not flickering then I've got something to offer people because everybody's busy going death death or death you know whatever they're doing about right. it so then, then I end up being somebody who's working with the dying, and people say, oh, he's so good, he's working with the dying. But I'm part of that circle which says, I work on myself in order to be an environment for other people to come up for air if they want to. And it turns out I don't really care which one I'm doing. I mean, there's an infinite variety of suffering. There's suffering in the rich, there's suffering in the poor, there's suffering in developing countries, there's suffering in affluent countries. There's just suffering everywhere. There's neurosis, and there's hunger, and there's everything, violence and terrorism. And where you stick your finger in the pot, if you sit around waiting, what's the most important suffering I can deal with, you just stay in your mind, afraid of making the wrong choice. It doesn't matter where you start. You can start in the laundromat wall with a little sign, uh, a blind person needs somebody to read their mail or something. It doesn't matter where you start. Mm -hmm. You can start in the grocery store helping somebody with the bundles. It doesn't matter. Because the minute you start that process, the work on yourself starts, and the work on your own heart, and the work on the qualities of compassion. And you get to watch all the fraudulent ways you try to help somebody, which is exquisite. I mean, you begin to see what a phony you are, you know, and how you're milking it for, aren't I good? And you've got to live with all that stuff, and it gets cleaner and cleaner as you just keep letting it go, honoring it, allowing it, letting it go. Yeah. It's a beautiful yoga. I, I would think as you get involved with people in the world of social activism, there's, there's a tendency amongst people in that arena to, to feel that work on themselves is unimportant and maybe even self-indulgent. That's more, uh, it's probably true, yeah. And um, I think that, uh, I think the art is to have the way in which you work on yourself become so subtle that nobody notices it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like saying, excuse me, I can't demonstrate I'm busy working on myself. It's not an either or proposition. I mean, I want to be right there with the people doing the actions, but I want to be doing them in such a way that it's, uh, uh, it's Gandhi's line, uh, that great story. Gandhi was on a train. He was about to go into an area where the Hindus and the Muslims were doing each other in, and everybody thought, this is going to be the one he's going to lose. He's going to get killed in this one. And a reporter was rushing along the platform of the station saying, Mahatmaji, give me a message to take back to the people. 
And Gandhi took a paper bag and he scribbled on it <clears throat> and he handed it out and it said, my life is my message. And I think if anything is my mantra, if you will, mm -hmm. of social action, it's my life is my message. It's, it's that the way I wash dishes in a soup kitchen is as much what, I'm, what I have to be about as the fact that I'm busy saying, well, we ought to wash dishes without getting angry or frustrated or anything. It's, am I getting angry and frustrated? And I think that the teaching turns out to be such a subtle one. I'm just learning that. I'm learning. You don't come on. You don't come on, I know, let me. You ought to work on yourself more. It doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. You do it so that people say, what is it about you? You seem to be having such a good time. With it, and I'm not. Why is it you're having such a good Now they're asking. That's a whole new <laughs> ballgame. It's a new ballgame. Mm -hmm. Rajiv had a wonderful line. He said, um, if one would escape from prison, the first thing that person must realize is that they are in prison. If they think they're free, no escape is possible. That's such a beautiful mind twister. Mm -hmm. That until you realize that you are not standing in the best place, forget it. Uh, let the person go on. You don't come on to them. You know, you have an interesting chapter in, in your book, How Can I Help?, uh, which deals with this concept of the prison and, and helping as a prison, feeling that I'm the helper yeah. puts me in a prison. Oh, boy. That the whole, I realize that the hype of helping is that the helper often psychologically helps at the expense of the helped that it is a way that reinforces roles and the helped is disenfranchised and the helper is empowered. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. It's not the act itself. I can take this uh, cup of water and offer it to you and I can offer it to you in a way where I build myself up and put you down by doing it. Mm -hmm. Or I can offer it in a way where it's our cup of water. You need it, you drink from it. I need it, I drink from it. In which I also appreciate that your receiving it is as much part of the contract as my offering it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the question of whether you identify with a role or not. And when you identify with a role, it ends up being divisive. Yeah. It separates people. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people in hospitals who are surrounded by well-meaning people who do good, and the person feels isolated and lonely and separate. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because everybody's busy loving them, but they're loving them as an object, loving the person as an object, and they're helping them as an object. And the art is being with somebody as subject, not as object. You often use the phrase sort of hanging out together. Hanging out, yeah. yeah. And it's really like one awareness and two forms, and we're talking to ourself now, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. We're just making believe that it's a game of dialogue, you know, because yeah. we're both reflecting to figure out the truth, and the truth lies behind both of us. And in a sense, anyone who's viewing us right now is also viewing themselves. It's all part of the same thing. And it doesn't matter who's doing the talking. That's the far. I mean, I lecture all the time, and I think I'm like a rent a mouth for, <laughs> um, a, for a process that's going on. And I just mm -hmm. say it good. I'm not busy being the speaker. Mm -hmm. I'm listening as well as everybody else is. This is a dialogue that includes the, the, the viewer and you and me, and we're all just figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I get the sense, uh, you know, and I, I go back and forth. Sometimes I think when we get very philosophical like this, uh, that, that it's a total head trip and, and maybe totally irrelevant to things happening in the world. And then I think to myself, no, it's, it's essential that nothing really changes until we change in this way by raising these questions. Yeah, I... Uh, uh... I think your latter view is probably the right one. I think that when you look at how you change a system, that the component of the system has to change, that the individual has to be standing in a slightly different place for the system of which they are a part to change. And that the minute, that's what uh, the story of a Buddha or a Christ or a Muhammad or something like that, they were all beings who were you say they were dancing to a different drummer or whatever that expression is. They were, uh, but they were, they were listening to a different part of their being. Mm. And the result was that they brought in uh, an oblique entrance into the whole system that, brought, that allowed the system to adapt in a way and shift. And you look at a system like a political um, governance system and the media 
and the constituency, and you see how everything's feeding back on itself in a networking way where everybody's reinforcing a conspiracy to see a reality as real. Mm -hmm. And then you see how you have to extricate yourself as an individual back in order to be able to contribute into it. Because you look at the conspiracy that we have collectively created and you realize people aren't happy within it. And there's no reason why we can't all be happy. That is really, there's absolutely no reason why that couldn't be. It's a, it's a conspiracy of mind that we're stuck in. That's it's bizarre that, that has its economic spin-off and its political spin-off and all this stuff. Well, ultimately, I suppose, if, if you take that seriously, it would seem like a, a spiritual mission for you to, to work to create a heaven on earth. But I'm doing that very selfishly. It's because I want to live in it. Yeah. I mean, I work on myself in order to be at peace, to be free, to be free of suffering, and to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I realize that as I succeed in that, I am an environment in which other people can do that as well in my presence. And there's nothing in me that's going to keep them stuck in their suffering. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what do you do with your time? And as you listen, and as you've experienced a unitive feeling with people, then you're in the interesting position where if they're hungry, it's not their hunger, it's our hunger. And then suddenly I'm in Guatemala, or I'm in Nepal, or I'm with the American Indians, or I'm with somebody dying, or somebody with AIDS. And they call, and it's like that part of us has just come into our, the consciousness, and out of that comes an action. It's interesting mm -hmm. that you just start to open yourself to the universe, and then the different sufferings make themselves manifest. You and know? the way you describe it, when you're working with the dying or when you're working with refugees or, or with people who are hungry, mm -hmm. in spite of their misery, you seem to be experiencing the most poignant uh, moments. Well, it's a combination, and that's the art. It's a combination that my heart hurts so bad because they hurt, and I'm aware of the pain of whatever their situation is. Then there's another part of me that loves them so much because they're just another face of the beloved. That's what Mother Teresa sees. She sees Christ in all his distressing disguises in the lepers and the people she deals with. And then there's another part of me that's just watching my own reactivity and getting quieter and quieter behind it. Mm -hmm. And there's another part that's just meeting another part of myself. You there, I'm here. You got your trip, I got my trip. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do for each other on the level of trips? but let's not lose that we're here. Yeah. And I go down to Guatemala and I go into a village where the people have hardly any education, the Mayan Indians, and uh, I look in the eyes of a widow and she's right there. And we are just fellow beings. We can't talk to each other because I don't speak her language. We can't even speak, but we're right there. We recognize the unitive quality of our being. And we realize we don't wish to do each other violence. We don't wish to, there's nothing we have to do other than maybe it'll be an exchange where I'll provide a hoe for her to hoe the land. Who knows? It doesn't matter what the game is. Because if she had something and I didn't, she'd give it to me. Is there a sense that, that she does have something that we, she does, we don't have? I'm getting have. it. Yeah. I'm getting it. Uh -huh. I come back from all these missions of doing good. I come back so enriched, you feel, end up feeling guilty. You feel like you're ripping off the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we we you know. take these meek people on the planet and, and strip them as we have of all possessions and any pretense to being somebody in the world and that leaves them with a sense of being which we've lost often. In we've often lost. Yeah. When I'm in India, I live in a little village in India a lot up in the foothills of the Himalayas and I live with people who they usually have one hot meal a day. I mean it's, it's, it's pretty good but it's thin. It's way below our poverty level in this culture. And I look in their eyes and their hearts, and those people are much more fulfilled than the middle class in this culture is. And I say, let me sit here and drink of the wisdom in these beings that allows them not to in equate their state of well-being with their material condition. Mm -hmm. And I realize that's something that I can help bring back to the West, if you will, in a way by my own being. Then the question is, how, what should be my style of life to make that statement? I mean, it, do I go live in a park? I mean, what's the way to make the statement? And then you realize that if you try to make it with your mind, it's too cute. You have to go in intuitively 
and just respond from moment to moment to hear how to do it. Mm -hmm. hmm. There have been various spiritual teachers who have written on social and political issues, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Aurobindo, Muhammad. Sure. Do any of these teachers really move you? Do, you? do you derive your inspiration from any of these writings? Yeah, a lot of them. Uh, it's a tricky one because when you go into the spiritual world, you can... You, see, social action is the action of good guys. It's the action of righteousness. And in Hinduism, that's known as the golden chain. It's the ultimate trap. You've got to go beyond goodness in order to be the goodness, not to do good. And so some of the spiritual teachers say, look, don't get involved in, like Ramana Maharshi says, what are you trying to help the world? You don't even know who you are. You don't even know what it's about. What are you busy doing something? You don't, you know, maybe you're creating more trouble than you're helping. And that's true, and often we turn out to yeah. be doing just that, by the uh, way. Many examples of Many this. examples in my own life, by mm -hmm. the way, so I do understand that. But then the others say, you can't wait till you're enlightened to do good because there's so much suffering around you and it hurts so and to the extent that you ignore it you are ignoring part of yourself and there's a cost in turning off yourself you've got to keep it under wraps so you work with the suffering in order to free other people you work on it as part of the game along with you know that's your method to get enlightened so the spiritual journey takes you both ways like Gandhi struggled with this all the time, and he'd go back into retreat, and then he'd come out. And he said a beautiful thing. He said, when you have surrendered completely into God, you find yourself in the service of all that exists. It becomes your joy and recreation, or recreation. And you never tire of it. There's no burnout. Because if, I, if this hand is in the fire and this hand pulls it out, this hand doesn't have to go and say thank you. This hand didn't do it to be a good guy. There's no burnout of doing it. It's just, it's the way it is. And that's the lie. That's where that kind of service comes from, of spirit. Mm -hmm. My um, Ishtadev, or my spiritual vehicle in Hinduism, and my name, Ramdas, which means servant of God, is Hanuman the monkey. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I mean, I'm a monkey worshiper at some bizarre level. I've got a monkey on my back, and, <laughs> and the question, One Hanuman, of the most popular gods in India. I know it, yeah. and Hanuman has incredible powers, and he has the powers. He's even known as the breath of Ram, and that's the name of God in that particular yuga mm -hmm. at that time, time span. And Hanuman has the power because he lives only to serve God. He's doing it all in order to serve God. And the interesting question of, and that's what Mother Teresa, that's where she's getting her juice. She knows she's only serving God. You know, I've seen these wonderful graphic images of, of Hanuman. I collect Hindu artwork, and, and right. it's incredibly powerful the way he, he rips, rips open, open his, his chest. chest. Yeah. Yes. That's the, the story of that is that he is given by Ram a beautiful a jeweled bracelet. And he starts to look at it, and it's very valuable, and he starts to bite it with his teeth and break it. And everybody says, what kind of an ingrate are you here? God's given you a gift, and you're... He says, this is of no use to me. He says, I don't see Ram's name written anywhere in it. And they said, well, then why don't you get rid of your body? And he, Because Ram's name isn't written there either. And he rips open his chest, and there's Ram and Sita in the middle of his chest, and every muscle and bone has Ram, Ram, Ram written on it. You see? And it's in a way that your cellular being has become, not out of a hypey thing, it's just you get so blissed out by becoming part of this larger game of law, or of, uh, it's not law is too uh, conceptual, it's um, this kind of Tao, the kind of way of things, yeah. the way of things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the name of God is a tricky, tricky Isn't it? Isn't it? business. It seems that it's a tremendous people path. all over the planet understand God in, in many, many ways, and yet it's the name of God that seems to divide them. The term God is a really tough one to work with. Mm -hmm. Well, do you believe in God? I mean, uh -huh. immediately it becomes a thing. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 
in a way, I'm sorry I even use the word anymore because mm -hmm. I don't know how to deal with it. I just, because it's mm -hmm. everything and it's nothing mm -hmm. and it's all you and I, but not us exclusively. I mean, Muslims and, and Jews are both monotheists. Yes. Ultimately, they have to have the same God if they all believe there's only one God, yes. and yet they seem to believe that they worship different gods. No, the trap is that there's the concept of the chosen people, mm. that some people are closer to God than others, and that's such a hype. That's such an unfortunate hype. Yeah. I mean, we're all the chosen people. The chosen people are the ones that listen to the Word of God. When Christ's standing there and they say, your mother and brother are without, he says, my mother and brother are the people who are with God. You know? It's not my physical, plain parents. It's my spiritual parenting. It's, mm -hmm. it's my spiritual family. And uh, it feels so painful to me that we are using religiosity is in such a divisive way in the world today. Mm -hmm. That's very, very painful. Too bad. And yet there have been... That's not too... It's the way it is, uh, but it's too bad. There have been efforts from time to time to, to unify politically by unifying in, in terms of everybody having the same name of God, everyone yeah, having the same Yeah, but usually the unifier is trying to rip it off for a power thing. Yeah. That's what's interesting. I mm -hmm. mean, very rarely are the unifiers surrendering into the process. There are some, like there was a beautiful man, Sufi Sam, Murshid Sam Lewis, mm -hmm. and he would go to... Uh, a Jewish Sufi. He would go, a Jewish Sufi, and he'd yeah. go to Palestine and he'd hold these dances which had in them uh, followers of Islam and, and uh, followers of, uh, of the Torah, and, you know, and they'd all dance together, and it would be called Dances of Peace. And he was a beautiful self, uh, very humble, I mean, wise guy. He was a rascal. He was, uh, I love that. I love that role. Yeah. I love that role in, in integrating these values. Mm -hmm. I mean, wasn't this the, the basic idea of Muhammad and perhaps Aurobindo and some of the others that there would eventually be a world government and it would be a theocracy of some kind based on this notion that we're all united in God? I think that the only really viable living social institution is the individual human heart. I think the minute you try to create any institutional structures beyond that, mm -hmm. it, um, it has a very short half-life <laughs> of living spirit mm -hmm. before it just decays into a, a memory of a thought, really. I think it's extremely hard to keep a United Nations living truth. I mean, which had a high aspiration, but it's a stinker to keep alive. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true of all social institutions. A marriage, you've got to keep reinvesting in it and reinvesting it and reinvesting it to keep it living truth. And anything less than living truth is demeaning to the human condition. You sound really. like an anarchist. Well, if you take that in a political way, mm -hmm. I would say that the social institutions that exist because they are true to the intuitive validity of the human hearts involved. Mm -hmm. That's anarchy in a sense. Like, like my guru once said to somebody about their marriage, he said, love is the only marriage contract. That's anarchy. Yeah. That's saying you've got to go back again and again and see if it's still true mm -hmm. that we are, should be together. In other words, if you're really in the here and now, if you're really true to the, to the truth of the moment, then any kind of institutionalization of that would be a violation. Yeah, unless you work, you say we are coming together in this institution to keep this quality alive. Mm -hmm. That's what the Seva Foundation is about. That's what we are attempting to do. We're saying, can we create an institution that can have the, the benefits of an institution in that we can collaboratively do more as a group? We can be a, an organization in the eyes of governments and things like that as we are in Nepal and still keep it living truth. And it's hard work. Mm -hmm. The boards are like group encounter. The board meetings are like group encounters. We've got to cut through all our stuff each time to come back to the living, the, to our vision. Once again, what is our vision? Are we just caught in a historical thought that we're now carrying out because we're good guys? That isn't good enough. It isn't good enough. And it's, at least for a number of years, has been working for the Seva Foundation. Right on the edge, right on the edge. I, uh -huh. If it doesn't, if you don't keep right on top of it, it can decay immediately into uh -huh. well-meaningness in which we're all milking it, it's all good, and oh, aren't you wonderful, you're doing such good work, and oh, thank you, you know, that whole thing, and you lost it. 
Well, there seems to be, as, as you mentioned, the, the concept of the half-life of an, of an yeah. institution, a period in which when institutions are founded and the original founders are there, there is this vitality. They, they stay sure. in the moment. They stay with the spirit. And then they become hardened and crystallized when the followers... It's like when the, it starts as a visionary or an entrepreneur, and then the managerial class or the priest class takes over. And the minute that happens, they have a vested interest in the power of the institution because that's where they get their juice while the visionary or mystic got their juice out of the connection with the living truth mm -hmm. and if you have an institution that forces each person to find their own truth the still small voice within that the Quakers talk about mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing then you're rejuvenating it because that's that social institution of the human heart is to me the living interface between the spirit and the material world and that's why each you've got to keep going back to that one well we began this interview by talking about the problems that we're faced with nuclear war uh, potential for holocaust ecological catastrophe it's as if if we don't really get it together on this planet we're we're facing the extinction of the human race and that all sounds very dramatic it does and from a hindu yeah. point of view ah so well that happened again <laughs> and we'll start yeah. again i mean because who we are isn't the human race the human race are like the fords or chevrolets that we we use uh, uh, mm -hmm. that's not behind it all we just are and as long as you're afraid of death mm -hmm. the fear is going to direct almost all your behavior we've got to ward off that mm -hmm. and finally you say yes it may indeed we may destroy ourselves this time around and I will allow that possibility and I will do what I can to prevent it but I'm not going to do it out of fear I'm yeah. going to do it just because it's my part to play mm -hmm. in the dance well I, I have to agree with you there we really do need to take a larger perspective yeah. and, and sort of step outside of our human skin here because in some sense life goes on in some sense something goes on yeah. something although the, even calling it something the Buddhists would take exception <laughs> to it. <laughs> I love it some process <laughs> continues mm -hmm. but if I were to step back inside of my human skin for a moment and not out of fear but out of out of a feeling of, of calmness and love and compassion desire th this beautiful thing this human race to continue yes and, and thinking in my own mind maybe in some visionary sense how can we unify ourselves realizing what we just said about institutions yeah. and, and, and the pitfalls of it happening through institutions there's there's almost I would say that there's nothing to do so be it be the unification oh. and then it will all happen around you but every time you look at somebody as somebody that you ought to unify, you've just made them into somebody and you've made them separate from yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you're doing something to them. And actually, there's only us. It's just we're all here and nothing's, it's all over. We won. I mean, there's, there's all these different ways of looking at yeah. the thing. Instead of, I've got to do all this work so we'll win, we already won. All we've got to do is, is allow the fact that we are in God's grace. It's all going fine. We're so busy making it into a hell all the time. Mm -hmm. We're saying, if there were only peace, I could be happy. There is what there is. Why can't you be happy with what there is? And do the best you can to relieve the stuff, but don't let your happiness be contingent upon it mm -hmm. so that you start to live like a winner instead of like a loser in the game with whatever you got. Mm -hmm. With whatever you've got. And that, go ahead. Let me, let me push the point a little Good. further. One, one of my... One of my mentors has been uh, the Harvard sociologist, Pitterim Sorokin. Yes. And who, who grew up in the Soviet Union, or before it was the Soviet Union in Russia, and became a very high cabinet member in the Kerensky government mm. before he came to Harvard. And right. when he was kicked out by Lenin, founded the Department yeah. of Social Relations at Harvard, where you taught. I was on the faculty, and he was way ahead of his time. Yeah. And a real, his book on altruism is exquisite. Uh -huh. He wrote at one point that he thought we might be moving into a period in which the Western style of capitalism and the Soviet style of communism would merge, that we would see the common unity there, that we aren't as good as we think we are, they're not as bad as they think they are, or as we think they are. Well, that's the benefit that the drug lords are giving us. 
because they're becoming a new common enemy. <laughs> it's just like if we were in attacked by beings from Mars or something like that. Suddenly the Russians wouldn't be so bad and their system wouldn't be so bad because we would all be united around something, which is what happened in the Second World War, yeah. around Hitler's vision of reality. That's right. And in the same way that the drug threat of of the exploitation of, of weakness, of addiction potential in human consciousness mm -hmm. uh, means that's becoming the prime issue now instead of capitalism versus communism. And now to keep uh, that paranoia going, you've got to keep working at it to keep generating the yes, but look what happened in Afghanistan, yes, but look at the Jews that still can't get out of the... All of which is true, but look at the way we are. If you. If you look at any system, it all has a lot of problems with it. Yeah. I mean, all of these systems. Systems themselves do not, a conceptual system is not the same as living truth. Living truth is not a concept, it's, mm -hmm. it's what it is. And you seem to also be saying that if we're unified because of a common enemy, because of a sense of uh, antagonism or hatred, we're not really winning the game. It's a very short term, it's a very short term unity. It's a cheap unity. Mm -hmm. The deeper unity is the unity of recognizing across the boundaries of Russian, American, Jew, Christian, Islam. You here, I'm here, you know. And that, that's why when, the, when we went to the moon and then took a picture of the earth and people saw that, that picture of the earth was worth many millions of words in the sense of giving people a sense of uh, McLuhan's global village or whatever you want to call yeah. it. That's the kind of game that up levels, but that's just on the physical plane. Well, there's something to the global village uh, in, in terms of what you mentioned earlier about, uh, about the uh, individual as being the primary institution because with, with media, with computer technology, it's as if Travel. we can bypass so many of these other institutional forms and people can communicate sure. to each other on a one-to-one -one basis. Multinationals have, ma have made nationalism an anachronism. It's just dying hard. Mm -hmm. roughly is what's happening. We are one economic system now and we're just learning how to we're just learning how to be with what's happened to us. It's like some major thing happens but everybody's busy holding on to who we were before it. Mm -hmm. Now you could say well we just moved from the industrial to the information age that would be one way of saying it but that's kind of trivializing it too and beyond that is the spiritual consciousness age you know you could do it that way. I don't know how to get hold of it all I know is we haven't yet grown into who we are. And who we are has nationalism as a, quite an anachronism. It's a functional unit the way our egos are, but nobody wants to live there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that sounds like a very optimistic note. Uh, it sounds as if, you know, back to our earlier point, that yeah. the human spirit has really evolved. Yeah, I guess I feel it has. Because, like, in, uh, my cu in my culture, in, in <laughs> this country, I noticed that 20 years ago, I would say the farthest out things I could find using drugs, using meditation, using everything. And there'd be a few people sitting there going, yeah, yeah, because they knew, because they were in the Explorers Club with me. Now, 20 years later, I speak to an audience that's prime, almost mainstream, not quite, mm -hmm. but they're from 20 to 80 years old. Most of them never took drugs. They never read Eastern philosophy. And I'm saying the same things I was saying 20 years ago, and they're all going like that. Now, how do they know that? How do they know? What got in? What, what, what mainstreamed? Mm -hmm. What See, something, it's as if what we did in the 60s, something really worked. Mm -hmm. Something happened. And we don't yet recognize it. History can't yet, because history, which is his story, is still telling the story from back there. It's not telling the story from what's happened yet. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. We were talking a little earlier about Aurobindo and his concept of, of history being a process of, of the higher consciousness yeah. working through people. Yes, and opening you open to let it come through you to manifest and the you become a conduit for the for the wisdom the higher wisdom to manifest on earth it's like mozart for example he's a good example mm -hmm. i mean you get a feeling of mozart you, most people have seen the movie where mozart's madly writing and you think is he creating that and then you realize he's just got a door open to where it is he's a great copier he's copying down this incredible music and uh, uh, 
He, and, and so you get that feeling with all the great creators, with Bach, with, with uh, Michelangelo. You get a feeling that they just were open to another plane of reality and they were just bringing it down through them. And when you open to that other plane of reality, you get a sense of the harmony of the universe, which includes the cacophony. It is not mean that all the tension or cacophony is gone. It's a tolerance for the complexity of the game. Because if you're going to get manifestation in form, you have to have positive and negative and dark and light and good and evil and, you know, all of it. Otherwise, there's no manifestation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there, <laughs> there isn't, so... <laughs> I, I, God, I... <laughs> so why are we talking about it? <laughs> Well, the fun is there's nowhere to stand. That's the ultimate wisdom. There's nowhere to stand that I, mm -hmm. I ultimate wisdom. That's another hype, but because <laughs> the statement is a lie. But the ultimate wisdom of nowhere to stand means any place you say this is real, mm -hmm. it's only relatively real. Here's where it's at. Yeah, yeah, including the fact that nothing ever happened and there's no mm -hmm. form. Yeah. So you just keep. At first, you go in and out of planes of consciousness sequentially. You get high and you come down, or you and I are talking, and who are we? Are we two men sitting talking? Are we two old cave dwellers sitting by the fire, re mm -hmm. exploring the deepest wisdom? I mean, which mythical game do you want to play about us? And then you go behind it, and there's only one of us talking to itself. And then you go behind that, and nothing's happening at all. There's just <laughs> you know, all this form. Well, what you're saying reminds me of the myth of the Greek god Proteus, who one wrestles with, and he always changes forms. Exactly. And to keep up with him, he becomes a uh, an animal. You've got to become a bigger animal, and then he yeah. becomes a different animal, and you yeah. have to change with exactly. him all the time. And the art is to just not try to be standing anywhere. Because the minute mm -hmm. you're standing somewhere, if he changes, you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the minute you're not anyone, then each moment is a new moment, and you see, who am I this time? Because mm -hmm. you don't even know who you are. Yeah. People say, who are you? I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. That's fun. That, I mean, people don't realize. It's like, what are you going to be when you grow up? Well, I'm not planning to grow up, so it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's this funny reversal of the whole mm -hmm. game of becoming somebody. The way I see it is we spent all of our early years becoming somebody. Then we started to awaken and we realized we got trapped in the creation of somebodyness and we go into nobody training. And then we become nobody, not nobody, which is somebody, but n nothing special and then we're everything. Mm -hmm. Kala Rinpoche, one of my beautiful teachers, he said, once you see the illusion, you realize you're nobody and being nobody, you're everybody. Mm -hmm. It seems that in the realm of politics, the real survivors are the ones who are able to sort of change with the moment. Exactly. And because they don't have such a vested interest in how it comes out. Mm -hmm. Because they're delighting in the dance of life instead mm -hmm. of, oh, I've got to make it come out this way. Yeah. Well, occasionally you get people like that and then they have their moment in the sun, but they fade because they can't change. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Exactly right. And the dance of the change and surrendering into the new moment, like a uh, very poignant was uh, Rosalind and Jimmy Carter's bi autobiography of what happened the day after they left the White House. And uh -huh. they're back in Plains, Georgia with all the mementos in the attic and the trucks drive away and there they are and they got the rest of their life. Now the question is, how quickly do you let go or how busy are you being milking your moment of worldly power, mm -hmm. which was just another trip really. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was very pleased to see Jimmy Carter working in the Bronx as, oh, as a I carpenter. Think I think he's worked very hard to continue to grow. Yeah. I think he, he's a good example of somebody making an effort mm -hmm. to stay. And that's why I work with aging a lot, because aging is got such a psychological hype going with it. I've been working on a book called The Wisdom of Aging to show the way in which we get, we conspire to make aging something that has, and we treat decline of certain capacities as loss. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, I go into Burma to a monastery and I sit down and I draw my awareness in from my hearing, from my seeing, from my smelling, in order to be quieter and deeper to do the inner work. Mm -hmm. When you get old, you lose your hearing, you lose your sight, all those things are the optimum conditions necessary for doing the inner work. And everybody's saying, oh my God, I can't hear like I used to. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. Terrible? I don't know. 
You have some remarkable examples in your book, How Can I Help, of um, people who have gone to help these so-called crippled, helpless people and discovered uh, that they had much to learn from them. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's incredible. I remember one story of, of a, a woman in a hospital working with mentally retarded children, I think of a mental age of two or three years old, and, and she was just trying to teach them how to say a, a simple thing like, I'm doing very well. And, yeah. And I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that. And, and the little the joy. kid... Was putting her on. Yeah. He winked at her yeah. at one point. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that other story of uh, the woman in the social agency who determined to help one of the needy women. Mm -hmm. And she tried to do everything. And the woman just, it, none of it ever worked. She couldn't, because the woman really wasn't trying very hard. And they ended up finally in a park in the rain, mm -hmm. in which the woman, the, the needy woman says, there's nothing more you can do for me. You've just been here. And they just sit there together in such quiet joy of just their friendship and their presence. And they both grew so much, and especially the one that was busy being the social agent. I love those stories. Mm -hmm. Well, and what you've done in this book is you've attempted to really address that question for people who sincerely want to help. And, yeah. and when they come up against it and, and, and realize there's so many of the things that we do that we think are helping end up not working. But it yeah. doesn't mean not to help. Yeah. It means to use your experience of helping as a way to grow. Mm -hmm. And there's such potential growth in helping another human being mm -hmm. if you'll be truthful about it all and bring your truth into the situation. Mm -hmm. And watch yourself get entrapped in a role and a conspiracy and then sit down and quiet down and see what you did and come back in it again. There's nothing wrong with losing it. Mm -hmm. Losing it is part of the journey. You lose it, you get up. You, as Aurobindo says, you brush yourself off, you look sheepishly at God, and you take the next step. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lovely image. And then you fall on your face again. Uh -huh. And helping is just a beautiful art form because we have such a, a, uh, a natural, compassionate heart. And what we're really afraid of is our own heart because our heart would give away the store. The heart says, here, take it. You need oh. it, you take it. Take it, take my life, take my money, take my car. And the mind is saying, now watch it. Think about tomorrow. Christ's image of be like the lilies in the field. That's like, be the heart. Just trust it all. Open. It's okay. And we are so frightened of that that we have built stuff that has ended up starving us to death. We are starving because we're afraid of our own hearts. And there must be another way. And that's what you do helping to explore. How you can allow that spontaneous compassion and spontaneous generosity to express itself and work with it and realize you can set limits without having to close yourself down from yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you point out is that perhaps the greatest gift we can give to other people is just to listen. Yeah, exactly, because they feel heard. Mm -hmm. They feel heard. But the, it's interesting to listen and to not get entrapped in their mind. To mm -hmm. listen, but to let it go. Mm -hmm. But to hear them, but not just buy it, but hear it. Yeah. Not to get caught up in I often in that. say, I hear you. Uh -huh. Sometimes that frustrates people because they don't want to just be heard. They want to be reacted to. They want to entangle you. They want to entangle you. What did you call it? Their reality yeah. net? <laughs> <laughs> there was a great lady uh, that came to visit me. She was a seamstress, and her, her youngest daughter had gone to visit her older daughter and forged a check. And she came in with a tale of pity about how her husband had left her, and she'd worked her fingers to the bone. She showed me to take care of these girls and now this girl had turned bad and it took her about 10 minutes to tell me it was like the ancient mariner and I listened as hard as I could and when she got all done I said I hear you she wasn't satisfied and she told me the whole story all over again <laughs> and when she got all done I said I hear you and at that moment I was just looking at her and she said you know she said I was kind of a hellion when I was a girl too mm -hmm. and at that moment she came up for air yeah. I heard her, but I didn't climb in because she had sucked everybody. Oh, you poor dear. Oh, my. Oh, that ingrate, you know, that whole thing. Uh -huh. And it's so important, I think, if, for people to hear themselves as they tell their stories, exactly. as how they grow. And then you become a mirror for them to see their own trip. Mm -hmm. And if they want to see it, they can. And if they don't, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. You don't lay a trip. You don't, I realize you morally have no right to take away another human being's suffering. That's a big one. That is a big one. I know it. I know it. 
I've really learned a lot about that because I you look at how somebody's suffering and you see if they shifted uh, and you want so especially if they're a family and you love them you want to take away their suffering and that is the quickest way to alienate them to create more paranoia because you don't even know why they're suffering you mm -hmm. don't understand well, I guess there's a sense, you, you mentioned earlier, the need to sort of look suffering right in the eye. And yes. That means to acknowledge it. Yes, and death as well. Mm -hmm. And death as well. Yeah. I've been preparing a slideshow. I'm delighted we're bringing death out of the closet in life. Mm -hmm. Slideshow, taking these images and asking people to stay with them and watch their own reactions and keep their heart open and see this as another face of the beloved. Just practice doing this. Mm -hmm. Just practice doing this. So as you walk down the street, the people you meet in the supermarket and the filling station, all of them, just other faces of, all other faces of beloved. It sounds like a tantric discipline, essentially. It is, yeah. Uh -huh. I have a, a little t table with holy pictures on it, and I have uh, Buddha and Christ and my guru, and I have, for a long time I had Caspar Weinberger on there, who uh, used to be Secretary of Defense, because I disagreed with his policy so strongly that when I would think about him, something would close in me. And I'd come in and I'd sit down and I'd light my incense and I'd say, good morning, Buddha, good morning, Christ, good morning, Maharaji, hello, Casper. And then yeah. I saw how much work I had to do. Yeah. Because until I could love him enough behind casper there was no way my mind could be an environment where he could change. Mm -hmm. if, he needed, if he wanted or needed to change. Maybe he doesn't want to, that's up to him. But I'm not gonna be, so busy locking him into who he thinks he is that he can't change. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds like you're attempting to, to live Christ's teaching of resist not evil. Wow, is that true? Resist not evil. I would say evil actions I resist and I oppose. Mm -hmm. I would say, but I don't see people as evil. Uh -huh. I see actions as evil, uh -huh. that actions increase suffering or separateness. Mm -hmm. I see suffering rooted in ignorance as Buddha did. Mm -hmm. And the ignorance leads directly into the illusion of separateness. And the minute you're separate, you're suffering. Yeah. And the crucial distinction here, again, is between the action and the person. Between the action and the person. Yeah. And the idea is you keep your heart open to the being at the same moment you're doing what you need to do about the action. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, when you're opposing somebody, like I was at an a, a anti-nuclear demonstration, and coming right up to the line and opposing a policeman or somebody and seeing them as another being just like you that's doing their best to find their truth mm -hmm. and loving them and at the same moment saying, I can't allow you to do that. I must mm -hmm. say no. Yeah. But saying no in a way that says, I love you. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the essence of the message of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And the, I had it so demonstrated by my guru in India because the word he used most frequently was jao, which means go, split, get lost. Hmm. I mean, other gurus, the people think of gurus saying, come, come. He was saying, go, <laughs> run this, go. You know, I come 6,000 miles, sit at his feet, offer him fruit. He'd look at me, hit me in the head and say, Jack, go. Hmm. And I'd say, go. And I was offended that he was sending me away. And then afterwards, I heard the word jao came hmm. out of a place where he was saying, go with love, everywhere is love. You, there's no, you don't just stay here, mm -hmm. it's all love, you know. Jiao, I love you, I mean. And learning how to say no in a way that brings people closer. Mm -hmm. That's such an art form, such an art form. That one is the, one of the deepest wisdoms that I've touched thus far. Mm -hmm. And I'm just learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. Go with love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and say no without closing your heart. Because like when you have a child, and the child wants an extra ice cream that you know is going to give him maybe a bad stomach or something, and you say, no, usually you're empathizing with the fact the child's going to feel frustrated. So you're feeling that, which closes you up a little. And then the child will probably be angry at you, so you're going to be the object of anger by someone you love, so that closes you up more. So you say no with a different tone than you'd say yes. And you become like a parent-child instead of two beings. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And a beautiful conscious being sees we're just dancing as parent and child. We're two souls, we're two beings. And for a while, I'll play like I'm your parent, and you play like I'm the, you're the child. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, I say no or yes, but mm -hmm. don't get lost in it. I'm still here. Well, Ram Das, it's been a pleasure playing interviewer with Hasn't you. Hasn't it been, Jeffrey? Yeah. For me, too. It's yes. been a real joy. Yeah, very nice. Thanks Thank so much for being with me. My pleasure.
and thank you for being with us.